on. Are we official? Is that we're ready to roll? Awesome. Thanks for coming and joining us today in my home city of Boston um, to listen to us talk about the continuous integration infrastructure uh, that we built for dealing with all the Microsoft components upstream in OpenStack. As I said, my name is Peter Pouliot. This is my colleague and dear friend, Octavian, Hi, aka everyone. Tavi. <laughs> um, yeah, and we're like to get in and basically start with a little bit of history of uh, sort of how we sort of got into uh, the CI and the path that we took um, to get there and the choices that we made, some of the problems that we've seen. Just fair enough. All right, so um, we have a really, well, it started with a really small group of individuals that originally started building the continuous integration infrastructure. Um, we essentially made a decision early on because it was the, pretty much the model that everybody was doing to use an undercloud of uh, KVM to host our DevStack instances. Um, because of the nature of Hyper-V at the time, we didn't have the luxury of being able to do nesting. So from day one, we've always had to have uh, physical compute nodes. And because we supported uh, shared nothing live migration from day one, uh, we had to require two. So. Um, essentially, we spent a significant amount of time early on uh, automating, you know, the layers of configuration necessary to prep the target environments, uh, specifically, you know, a lot of the Windows uh, side as well. And we tried to use as much of the upstream automation for uh, configuring the OpenStack environment. You know, early on, specifically, that was uh, PackStack. So. <laughs> To give you a big picture, we run one of the largest continuous integration infrastructures in all of OpenStack. Um, and, and a lot of it's because of the physically demanding uh, nature of you know, our hardware requirements. We need to have a lot of hardware to be able to satisfy the incoming requests. So starting in 2012, uh, I started working here at Microsoft. And, and halfway through the year, we started amassing equipment uh, to begin building. Uh, the continuous integration infrastructure. So there was three racks originally located uh, across the river here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and essentially over the course of the you know, next few years, we did thing, we essentially continued to grow as we were building this, acquiring more hardware. Now the hardware we acquired was essentially acquired out of other engineering teams that were recycling equipment. And as we grew, we went from three racks uh, at the beginning of 2012, uh, to uh, a set of an additional racks that were located on the other side of Cambridge, Massachusetts, so about five blocks from where our first racks were. So we essentially had to uh, build a man, for those of you who are telecom geeks, and I never thought I would ever, <laughs> ever even use that terminology, but a metropolitan area network across the city of Cambridge using dark fiber. And unfortunately at that time, you know, given the equipment we had, uh, we were essentially running over trunked one gig one gigabit links across the city. And in some cases early on, our test loads would have Hyper-V nodes <laughs> five blocks away and, uh, and, and KVM nodes uh, in the building over here, uh, you know, sort of computing through a straw, as I like to think about it. So, um, yeah, shortly after that, when we expanded into the space, uh, you know, we were able to, as I said, gain more equipment uh, from some other uh, local Microsoft engineering teams. And essentially, we were able to you know, add a significant amount of capacity, uh, specifically in a hundred, it was 120 uh, one U nodes. Um, and we were able to light that up uh, shortly before, I forget which summit that was, but whichever the one was at the end of 2013. Okay, so fast forward a little bit. You know, as, we, as we kept adding capacity, we kept running out of networking. So we were fortunate enough to get uh, some budget from Microsoft to essentially build an entirely new network infrastructure for the continuous integration uh, lab. And the first, well, the, the first time we rebuilt it, it was uh, all Cisco gear, Cisco Nexus, and essentially that allowed us to get uh, full 10 gigabit connectivity across the city, uh, as well as you know, a much more stable platform and enough port density going into each rack so now we could essentially segment our data plane uh, network services from the, you know, the data plane test side of the fence from our production services that we were using to manage and maintain the core infrastructure. Um, 
which was a, a huge deal because it helped simplify uh, a lot of troubleshooting uh, rather than having to stare at the racinets of packets that were you know, going by and you weren't sure which was which. We now had a dedicated, isolated data plane to you know, allow the uh, testing side of the fence to be operated in its sort of own encapsulated area. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so fast forward a, a little more. Uh, after the network, we've, we basically spent two years just getting <laughs> large amounts of hardware uh, due to the nature of uh, a local IT guy that liked me and liked to send pallets of equipment to me. So uh, literally in the course of the two years, we probably processed racking, unracking, cabling, uncabling, pulling all the parts out, you know, roughly almost just shy of 2,000 servers. Um, and essentially we got to the point where uh, you know, we had somewhere in the aspect of 17 racks of equipment. You know, probably close to 50 plus different types of server models. Um, you know, starting, operating. Starting actually from server suite, four gigs of yes. memory, and going up to server suite 128. So it was really a very large spread of types of hardware. Yeah, so the problem that we had from get-go was always being under, not having enough tools, uh, not having enough hardware to do the job, and the hardware that we had was uh, substantially, uh, let's say, underqualified for what we were doing. But the beauty of that is it forced us into, you know, sort of survival mode and uh, resiliency mode and uh, do whatever it takes to make it move forward mode. So, you know, we, I, I love to say that, you know, our first, the, when we first stood up the continuous integration infrastructure for a period of time, we actually processed more CI votes than upstream Jenkins. And we did it on Hyper-V nodes that had four gigs of RAM. So, you know, I always joke with these guys, I'm like, if anybody who saw the movie Rocky V, it's kind of feels like that. So, you know, you're old, you're broken down, uh, your body parts don't function, but when we process a job, you're gonna feel it. <laughs> so, uh, to move forward a little, a little more, uh, shortly, well, actually about last year, uh, about uh, towards the end of the year, we received another influx of hardware. This time, some actually decent hardware coming out of the engineering teams in Redmond. And we received some high density compute, high density storage, uh, and real infrastructure. So we set about uh, for three weeks, the cloud based team and myself sat here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, screaming at each other in a data center, uh, fighting over how we're going to do this and essentially assembling the next generation of our continuous integration infrastructure. So essentially what that means is today we, we have a, a series of uh, roughly about 78 nodes per rack. Uh, it was 78, 76 uh, nodes 78. per, 78 nodes per rack uh, of highly dense quanta uh, compute power. Uh, roughly I think they have around 96 gigs of RAM. Uh, the core of our under cloud is all SSD based. We have 10 gigabits to the host, 40 gigabit backplane. So as you can imagine this helped our CI processing substantially. In fact, I think it, it didn't drop our test runs to roughly about an hour or so. Even less, so we actually have uh, most of the runs now somewhere between 35 and 45 minutes. So and before we were actually running, doing a full uh, Tempest run in roughly around one hour and a half. So I want to go through this to give you an idea of what the level of hardware issues and all those things that we had to deal with just to get off the ground. It's been, a, you know, we spend a, a significant amount of time doing what I like to call the rack and stack workout. And when I say we, I really mean, mean me, uh, because these guys are located in Romania and I'm the only one locally here sitting in the data center. So big and strong. <laughs> so the, you know, as we said before, you know, when we started doing this, Hyper-V brought some significant challenges. And you know, most, as I said earlier, most of the people in the community did a, their test runs were a single dev stack instance running on somebody's cloud, nesting a VM. Because we didn't have that luxury, and because of what was available to us at the time, we needed to be able to automate any, pretty much any Linux distribution, any Windows flavor, multiple hardware patterns, uh, you know, all the supporting applications and processes. And you know, because of the high demand of the of the needs for physical compute, obviously, you know, we, we just had the, the challenges kept piling up. Um, so you know, basically, what we run on, what we ran on in the first generation was essentially a CentOS under cloud, as we said earlier, using KVM with Ubuntu 
uh, as a DevStack VM for the upper cloud that we would then plug our Hyper-V compute nodes into. So if we talk about automating, now let's, if we paint the landscape of what DevOps tooling looked like for Windows back in uh, 2012 when we started this, uh, Windows support was minimal at best uh, in Chef and it was slightly better in Puppet. So at that time, as a result of that and the fact that Puppet supported some 15 odd platforms, I made the decision to start automating in Puppet because it was, had the most sort of uh, Legos already readily available for me to begin. So we set out and started creating a basic framework for uh, pulling together all the necessary pieces uh, that were already there uh, to enable us to get to the point where we could put OpenStack on Hyper-V using underneath the, uh, the, basically all the binaries that were already being produced out of the community. Now, you know, once we get to that point, now we needed to automate the rest of it. So, uh, you know, we essentially started a, a I started building a, a Pixie infrastructure that allowed me to change the, you know, between different Linux distributions that had similar patterns because some days, unfortunately, when, when we first began, the uh, Microsoft lab infrastructure wasn't always kind to me and the proxies that we used to have to go through back then, um, you know, once again, would prevent you from getting fr to uh, some installation sources on one day and then the next day it would work. So you had to be able to switch from CentOS to Scientific to Fedora to Debian to Ubuntu just to be able to see if you could get something to run. So to continue that, once again, with the, you know, on the automation side, obviously with such a large amount of servers and having such a high need to be able to control the environment, we had to essentially build a, a network infrastructure that we could uh, control and essentially provide static leases for, if we wanted to, for any network interface on any device in our network. So once again, we built a, a you know, IC DHB cluster that essentially would bulk load YAML uh, for every network interface, every subnet, uh, you know, every piece of DNS information, and dynamically assemble uh, you know, effectively our IPAM infrastructure um, to, to deploy it. Now, the, the good thing about this is it allows us the ability if any one of the nodes goes down, we can redeploy it in less than seven minutes and the cluster come, the clusters, you know, there's no service interruption. I can move it between operating systems and it doesn't care. Now, we roughly have, well, <laughs> before we decided to skip uh, looking for some white space problems, we probably had close to 20,000 lines of fair data that we fed into this. Uh, system to create the network. Today, we're roughly about, uh, just under about 13,000 lines of Heradata in YAML that we, we pass into that. Additionally, you know, with so many network devices and we had some tooling that we would use to pre, you know, pre-build pieces before we would move them in, we needed to be able to dynamically change between Pixie infrastructures across the data center. So we automated patterns in Jenkins jobs to be able to swap VLANs and uh, swap the HTTP relays and the switching infrastructure and deal with a lot of expect and just being able to manage large amounts of hardware with very little people. So, um, yeah, in the last year, uh, just because we've generated a lot of, you know, from, from the legacy perspective of the automation that we've written, we've generated a lot of puppet code. So over the last year, I've been trying to see what sort of is available, what, what I have that is actually hasn't been sort of I guess created again uh, since then, and what I have that's still useful uh, to potentially, essentially I wanna put it back in the community in the upstream puppet forges and all that stuff. But today, if, if anybody's interested, you can go look at my you know, public GitHub repo and all that code is there. So from a CI contribution perspective, um, we have 11 CIs, you know, Nova, Neutron, Compute Hyper-V, Networking Hyper-V, Cinder, which includes iSCSI, SMB for Windows, and SMB for Linux, Manila, OSWIN, OVS. And as I said, we maintain a production uh, CI facility with 700 servers, around 200 plus switches, and uh, multiple storage devices. From a CI voting perspective, here's sort of a, um, sort of a, a, I guess, shows our percentage of how we participated in voting throughout the release cycles, right? So as you can see, we, we handle a significant amount of the voting for the community. And you know, that's a lot of test 
processing that you guys probably don't know or are actually being tested on, on Windows. So, um, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. So here's a, a graph that one of our colleagues uh, created just to, so that, that shows some of our, you know, different activity across the CIs in this case. Now, I'm gonna bring Tavi in to talk a little more about what we did in the new CI uh, because we changed a lot of the automation at that time. So Tavi, if you wouldn't mind. So if initially we actually had uh, focused on uh, two CIs, we started with Nova and Neutron. Currently, this is the full list of uh, CIs that we actually run. A couple of them, as you might see, are still under uh, testing, so they are not fully reporting upstream, but all of them are actively running in our environment. So getting back to what Peter was mentioning, we had a major upgrade in the hardware in the CI in 2016, and together with that upgrade, we decided to also upgrade the software infrastructure we rely on when we do the testing. We actually moved towards uh, deploying all the bare metal components using MAS, since we also integrated in MAS support for uh, Microsoft workloads and Windows Server, and we use for orchestration, we use Juju. The main reason why we actually switched to Juju is the fact that we can uh, take advantage of uh, all the facilities that it provides for uh, detecting if any of the components that you require is already deployed and it will not deploy again. So for instance, in any CI run, we are using actually one dev stack, two Windows server nodes, which need to be joined into an Active Directory. So whenever we do a run, if the Active Directory is already deployed, it will just register those nodes to Active Directory. If by any chance that Active Directory fails or something happens to that machine that runs Active Directory, and the system at Juju cannot connect to it, it will automatically deploy a new instance of the Active Directory. So it really helps us in uh, avoiding a lot of failures that may happen in the CI due to infrastructure reasons. So a few words about the solutions that we deployed. We moved, since we had better hardware, we also moved towards an HA approach. MAS is deployed on two nodes. We use HA proxy between the two nodes, so we can actually take advantage. If any of the nodes had any issues, we use through HA proxy and a floating IP, we actually revert to the second one. Uh, because we didn't have a very large amount of hardware, we didn't deploy it in a three node, which would be actually the, let's say, recommended way of using it we stick with only two. That means that uh, if anything happens and we fail over, the re bringing back the second node, which had issues, will happen manually. So we have to intervene and bring that manually. But we, we still make sure that the CI runs fine even if one of those nodes fails. And we consider that this is a, a good enough trade-off for us at the moment, considering the hardware limitations. Juju is as well uh, deployed in uh, HA mode. We have two virtual machines, actually three vir virtual machines which are deployed. So Juju is always in a full HA mode. And uh, since uh, the number of CIs grew, our team as well grew, and we use different users for different CIs. And in order to make sure that uh, we will not have users interfering with uh, other groups CI environments and uh, servers, we created the jump box and we use that jump box with dedicated user for each CI. We, this is a short list of the models we have in Juju. Juju has the facility of defining users and models and linking particular models to a user. So for instance, if uh, we have the user OVS running two of the CIs, the Neutron OVS and the OVS CI, that model will never be accessible even by that mean. You can just list and see that that model exists. Even at that mean, at that mean, you cannot query and get information about what happens inside that model. Only the user that owns the model can actually see what is happening inside it. And this is a short list with uh, all the models, and it also shows at at that particular moment, a snapshot of how many machines and how many cores, CPU cores, were allocated to each of the CIs. As you see, the 
most of them are actually in the infrastructure model where in the infrastructure we have all the compute Hyper-V compute nodes which are shared by most of our CIs. Now let's get a bit into details on all the components. The first and the, the most important one is actually the Zool model. Uh, in our case, since we have a large number of CIs, we wanted to make sure that we will not have issues. In case one of the CIs goes bad and starts reporting upstream a lot of errors or something happens and the account gets suspended, we couldn't afford getting all the CIs suspended because they are linked to the same account. So we created accounts for each and every CI. This means that uh, in Zool, we have to have actually a Zool instance for each and every account that we run. And uh, also, the Zool has two other components. It has the Gearman component, which is actually the central unit of processing, and it has the mergers, which always collect for each and every incoming request, collect the upstream uh, patches, and create the pre prepared uh, Git pool to be able to test that required patch. And we are running now in a structure where we have on one single bare metal node, we have on the machine itself deployed Gearman, and we have as container, we deploy two mergers just to make sure that if one of them, for whatever reason, fails, we can still go on and uh, run the CI, and we deploy one instance of uh, Zool server for each account. The code that we use, we had to change. There is a Zool charm available, but unfortunately, the upstream Zool charm does not allow this separation of each and every Zool component if you want to run only that particular component in a container or in a node. So we had to extend it, and uh, we are uh, preparing actually the code to be contributed upstream as well. It's available on uh, the GitHub link on our GitHub. On the infrastructure model, we actually deployed in the infrastructure the Jenkins component that runs all the jobs that we need, and it's actually connecting through the Gearman plugin to the Zool Gearman. We have the log server, because of course we need to collect and provide back to the community the result of all the tests. We actually have, in order to speed up all the tests, as mentioned before, we managed to reduce the total time from over one hour and a half to roughly between 35 and 45 minutes. So in order to do that, we also have in-house in deployed caches, caches for both the Ubuntu packages and for all the PyPy caches. For PyPy, we use actually DevPy in a two-node deployment, so we take advantage as well of failover in case of any of them has an issue. We notice that sometimes DevPy has the so-called feature of hanging, so from time to time, one of the nodes happens to block, so this is why we, we go always with two nodes of DevPy deployed. Also in the infrastructure, we have uh, deployed all the Windows Server 2016 nodes, which are actually, there is, they create a pool of nodes from which we always select pairs of two for each and every test run that we do for Nova, Neutron, and all the other components. So these are shared and recycled. We do not redeploy those nodes for each and every run. We just clean them up and reuse them. <laughs> the undercloud model, it's uh, actually defining the OpenStack undercloud with, on which we actually spin even today, on the new CI, we spin DevStack virtual machines that will become the controllers for all the tests. So we have a virtual machine, which is DevStack, which uses a flat networking to communicate with the bare metal Hyper-V nodes that we have uh, deployed and are available from the previous model. Most of the CI, as I mentioned, use this uh, format of undercloud and overcloud. This is because we still need to get as dense as possible in our environment. There are a few CIs which do not allow this, but as often as possible, we try to create, to use virtual machines to do that. So we are actually having a few limitations here because we use a, the same flat networking 
for uh, as a data plane for all the tests, we have to make sure that, for instance, the VLAN ranges that we use in the test have are separated. So each and every run will actually query uh, through a script, query a database a table, and reserve a particular VLAN range. Because if not, you will end up having uh, multiple runs and multiple instances of uh, DevStack that can create traffic and overlap between them. And uh, although you have theoretically a direct connection between the compute nodes and their own controller, this traffic will actually interfere and you will see that some of the tests will actually fail due to this. So it's really strongly recommended to separate all the time the VLAN ranges if you have multiple tests running in the same environment. <laughs> in case of Cinder, we have uh, another node because we also test Cinder on Windows, so we need a third Windows node which is also going to be uh, allocated from the same pool that I mentioned before. All the, all the build process happens in parallel, so we, whenever, after we allocate all the nodes and we start the DevStack VM, we start in parallel building on both DevStack and all the Windows nodes. Uh, currently, we are still looking on ways to optimize the DevStack build because we ended up basically the Windows nodes, since have, they have less resources and less processes basically to build, uh, finish in roughly around 10 minutes while the DevStack build takes around 20, 25. So we are still looking on ways to minimize this. One of the things that we do, the image that from which we actually start the dev stack, it's pre-populated with all the GitHub repositories and we update that image constantly, basically one every, once every two, three days to pull out on all the projects that uh, are required to pull the latest information in all the GitHub repositories. Now we're getting to the other side. As I mentioned, most of the projects can take advantage of the undercloud over cloud, but there are some on which we cannot afford this luxury, unfortunately. Mainly, all the projects that run OVS and use OVS as the underlying layer do not, require, do not take advantage of this. The main reason is the fact that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to ensure that all the that there are no leftovers to say so after an obvious run. Because on Windows, for instance, uh, if anything happens and the obvious build is not correct, you can get a blue screen, you can get uh, leftover uh, components in the kernel space, and you never know that after the cleanup, the node is actually clean and ready to be reused, or you have things that remain there, like ports or other things that you couldn't clean up, and those will affect the subsequent tests. So in these cases, we always go with deployment from zero, basically. We de deploy the full operating system and all the packages that are used for testing on top of that. In order to optimize here as well the functionality, we actually use a node pool. We have a modified version, since I, I know that AppStream the community has also a node pool, but in our case, not what NodePool does, it actually ensures that uh, we have nodes registered in Juju and actually have only the OS and the Juju agent deployed, and we always have those nodes ready to be used by Juju whenever a new request comes. So we always spare those 10 minutes to say so that might be taken to deploy the operating system when we need to do a test. So at the moment, uh, the way the OVS CI is working, this is a, a CI that actually covers not directly the OpenStack project, it's a CI that covers the pure OVS contributions. And unfortunately, in this case, we do not have the luxury of taking advantage of uh, Gerrit and other things. The, they only use mailing lists, and uh, besides mailing list, they have only the repository and you, we can just query the repository to find out when there are new commits. 
we are in uh, discussions with the community to be able to implement actually GitHub hooks. So from outside, our jobs are going to be triggered whenever a commit gets in. Uh, we have for obvious two steps because for obvious we need to ensure that the system works fine. The first step that we do is run unit test on one single Windows node. So we run unit test and we build basically the obvious installer. And once the obvious installer runs and we see that all the unit tests pass, then we move forward to having a full integration test where we actually use the generated installer, we deploy it on two Hyper-V nodes, together with the Nova and Neutron component, we deploy a DevStack VM, and we use that to actually do a full integration Tempest run. Currently, on this system, uh, we are reporting upstream to, through mailing list. So only on the mailing list, we are reporting all the unit test runs with success or failure, and details we are not reporting at the moment. We are still evaluating the reliability of the CI to make sure, and we plan to actually enable reporting in the next couple of weeks for the integration test. For monitoring, since the, the CI is nice, it runs okay, but we always need to know what happens, actually, and if there are errors, what's the reason for that? Uh, for monitoring, we have chosen Zabbix. We are actually uh, monitoring uh, OS level information, we are monitoring uh, OpenStack services for the Anter Cloud, uh, we are monitoring the status of uh, Hyper-V node and uh, status of the networking. This is actually work in progress. It's not fully done. We had it uh, implemented in the older CI and we are now migrating all the components to the new deployed environment on uh, the Quanta gear. For uh, monitoring and being able to actually identify which node is located where and has issues, we also use rec tables. And we integrate rec tables with uh, Zabbix to be able to see from the rec tables interface if a particular node had particular issues. I will actually switch a bit to a browser to show you some uh, live information. Actually, let me try and connect to the environment. Is it visible? Nope. And that would be interesting to see why. Do you know how to turn on the? Is it like, uh, I don't know, is it one of these? Like function F11 or something? I mean, uh, one of those, bunch of keys. Oh, right there, right there. Hmm. Duplicate. Excellent. And I guess it's a bit small. Can you just like control plus plus plus? No? Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> but over no. here it doesn't work. So in order to see the, can you actually see what's written there? Okay, in order to see the status of uh, the infrastructure, we can use Zool status and minus M means Wait, selecting the particular Before we start, will someone order Tavi uh, Uber just in case we have to go and fix it? <laughs> no, sorry, mm. he's running on production systems. So. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's better. So th this is actually a view of the infrastructure model. It actually has most of the nodes. On top, we can see the list of uh, so-called applications, so basically types of charms that are deployed. It's Jenkins. We have a Jenkins slave, which we have one slave for each uh, Hyper-V node. Uh, we have the logs component, the Ubuntu cache repository. 
we have the Active Directory and the Hyper-V nodes. Here we have a full list of uh, servers and components. This is the list of actual machines on which those uh, applications are deployed. And at the end, we have the list of relations. The relations communicate, establish, establish a link between, for instance, between Jenkins and the slaves. That means that when a relation is set between a slave and uh, Jenkins, that slave is registered in uh, Jenkins. So if it's not, the process is actually has two stages. Stage one is to deploy the slave, and stage two is to establish that relation between the charm which represents the slave and the charm that represents the Jenkins master. If we can, we can actually destroy that relation, and when we destroy it, basically all the slaves remain registered and installed on the Hyper-V nodes, but they will no longer show up in the Jenkins master. For some reason today, I always try to type Zul instead of Juju. You should go to bed earlier. <laughs> yes, and since I share the screen, I can no longer see the last line. Actually, this would be interesting. Here, this is the list of actually all the containers that we run with all the Zool processes that we have. As I mentioned, Gearman is the first one. It's deployed directly on one machine, the machine number one, and all the others are deployed as containers, LXD containers, on the same machine as the Gearman at the moment. And now let's switch to a nicer view. This is actually the interface that uh, MAS provides where you can see the status of all the nodes. And I can bet we even have a few failures <laughs> over here. These are actually uh, nodes that are, for this one's in the release, yes, as expected, since we know that there are a few bugs still in the OVSCI, these are actually nodes that had some issues and could not be properly released after we ran some obvious integration tests. I was gonna say, I know that rack. Yeah. I know that rack. <laughs> so one of the advantages of MAS is that you can actually see a lot of information on every single node that is here. Basically, whenever you, if you add new hardware, you just plug it in, you power it, you cable it, you power it on, and it will show up in MAS directly as a new node. You can run a so-called commissioning script that actually will identify all the hardware and will get you all the information about the node. For instance, we can, I have already opened a couple of tabs. For instance, this is uh, one node from the rack where we have all the controlling data plane. And we can see the, a small summary. If there are any tags, uh, we can actually see the power type, which is in this case IPMI, the IP user and password used for connecting, the list of interfaces, as you can see in this case, this is, ah, it's Rack 12. This is actually one of the nodes that uh, is uh, dedicated for the obvious yes. testing, and this is why we have such a large number of interfaces. Uh, we have uh, one uh, pair of 10 gig uh, interfaces, so one card with two ports. We use that, uh, and we use also another one. The first two in four interfaces are some interfaces also four interfaces of one gig, which are actually on the same card. And we use that card and the one with 10 gig to also test when, whenever we need to test bonding and how obvious works over bonding. Because we also use, uh, from time to time, when we need to do performance tests, we can manually allocate one or two nodes from this rack, we basically, uh, stop the Jenkins uh, slave on them, and we can manually allocate them for performance testing for a certain period of time. So this interface actually gives us a lot of flexibility 
to bring nodes in and out of the running CI whenever we need to. And just a quick look here. This is basically how our Jenkins looks with all the jobs. For instance, these are the Cinder jobs. Uh, they are running fairly stable at the moment. Uh, this actually, the, the one we read, as you can see, it was actually using, it was not running since a long time. It, uh, it was using still Windows Server 2012 for a Cinder uh, node. So we switched to 2016, and since then, the system is way more reliable. Okay, this is getting back to the presentation. And of course, now I have to find a way to. So, you know, just a couple more things while we're still here. You know, one of the things that we, we sort of ended up doing as a result of having so much hardware and getting used to using the Jenkins model of, uh, you know, processing CI jobs is applying the same model to do operational tasks across the data center. Now, a perfect example of that is we have a, you know, another in the, 19 plus racks of equipment that we have. We use APC managed power uh, PDUs. And uh, you know, when we got those, we need to both enable SSH and um, you know, firmware upgrade them. So essentially through a series of parameterized Jenkins jobs in under two minutes, we were able to update, upgrade the whole data center at once. And essentially the upgrade process for each device was essentially FTPing th uh, three independent files with a reboot in between. And we were able to do it, you know, and I, it's funny because when I've been walking around and talking to other, you know, ops teams that just manage IT, you know, I, if, if I ask them like, you know, hey, so-and-so at big company, how long would it take your IT team to do that task? In most cases, they're like, well, it'd take that one guy, you know, the one week or two weeks to walk around the entire data center and do it manually. So I think there's, you know, one of the things that I've been learning out of this process personally is, is you know, these, pro the, the tasks and the mechanisms we're using in continuous integration can actually make ops life a hell of a lot easier, but it requires some rethinking about how you're scripting because it's a lot easier from my perspective to parameterize the Jenkins jobs and just pump through a loop of a curl, you know, sending curl commands than encapsulating all in either Python or Bash or whatever. So anyway, um, we'd like to open the floor for questions. Uh, go ahead. So we have, so essentially you can think of it as, as we have two completely independent networks. We have one that's not connected to anything, and then we have the one that is our, what we call management. The one that, that, is, well, that I say is not connected to anything, the only way to get in and out of it is through, the, through our neutron controller on the undercloud. So we isolate, we, that we use that one. So if you think about that, the VLAN is, in, remember VLAN is an L2 isolation mechanism, right? So we use VLANs on the, on the data plane network side to create the 4,092 network segments and then we take a bunch of those network segments and essentially deploy identical environments across those ranges of VLANs, right? Using the VLAN as the mechanism for isolation and the external floating IP of the, uh, coming out of the network controller to get back and forth between uh, what's going on inside the data plane infrastructure and our, you know, let's say production services or helper services on our management infrastructure. So does that, does that answer your question? So do you run all of your CI So there, once again, our CI infrastructure is external from CloudBase's network. It's external yep. from Microsoft's network. It is its own dedicated infrastructure that I built for this. You have, to, you have to realize a lot of this had to do with the way things happen historically, right? You, you know, in, in all honesty, when I, like I said earlier, when I started at Microsoft, their typical you know, corporate lab infrastructure was heavily proxied, no direct internet access, all this stuff. You can imagine what a nightmare it was. So we had to literally guerrilla style and, and say, we're gonna ignore all the rules. 
Now, you know, I'm not going to go and advocate this to everybody because we have a very unique circumstance that we're trying to, you know, change Microsoft. So I was fortunate enough early on in my career to work with Microsoft and a lot of IT people in Microsoft where I would be showing up to a room full of IT people and I was the only IT person coming out of the side of the organization I was in. So I, I ended up early on, got the respect of the gentleman who runs uh, information technology along the East Coast and essentially, you know, we, we've helped each other out through the years and he was the one who allowed us to have this environment which is not a standard environment from within Microsoft and because in all honesty, because I had been part of the team that put Linux on Hyper-V originally, and we had gone through this process once before getting Novell to have the type of environment necessary to run the testing we were doing at the time, which was non-standard because of things like needing SSH access, needing actually direct internet access, needing those things, right? Um, that we had already done it so many times with him before that he knew exactly what it was and was able to help us na navigate through whatever we needed to navigate to to get what we needed done. Now that's the thing, we've been very, very fortunate and lucky to have you know, key individuals inside the Microsoft organization to help us get there. But we wouldn't have been able to do the level of, of detail and automation that we did, uh, you know, in all honesty, had we started this in Redmond. Just because of the nature of the bureaucratic policies of information technology departments and you know, everything, it's just, it's, it's tough, right? And, that's, and I'm sure, you know, anybody who's running continuous integration in an enterprise business environment, you're going to have the same bureaucratic, political, um, you know, management type discussions uh, <laughs> that we've had for years now, right? So, hope that um, answers your question. I'm going to make it very quick because I know we're getting towards the end of the time. Um, first thing, what you're saying there about like separate network and that, we found the exact same thing. I was previously working in Intel and we, we had our own third party CIs keeping that as far like in its own separate thing gave us so much more freedom to actually build up that infrastructure and do things the way we wanted. The second thing is you were talking about open vSwitch and the yep. problems in getting patches that you wanted to test because they don't use Garrett. Um, as an informational thing, there's a tool called Patchwork, which yep. the open vSwitch mailing list use. That's got uh, 2.0, I think release candidate one of that came out about a week ago, has support for this thing called checks, which lets you post results for CIs up there. And it also has a REST API which you can use to pull in patches uh, and drag them into your CI. So that's probably something that you should, you could do yeah, worth having a look at. At the moment, the way we are doing, we are actually posting directly to the mailing list. Yeah. We actually send emails to the mailing list with the results and uh, we use polling for uh, checking the, if new patches are committed. We also have a script to check that if in the interval there were more than one commits that got in, we are actually going to go through all of them in the order they were actually got received. But yeah. thank you yeah, for the so, question. Yep. Yeah, so series support and stuff, also part of that. So. It will definitely make our life easier. Any more questions, guys? Ladies, go ahead. Well, you have to realize when we started doing this, all there was was DevStack. Sure, I just wondered if you'd ever like reevaluate your system. Well, it's, it runs fairly fast. It runs, it's fairly reliable, yeah. and it really keeps close with all the components that we need. For instance, when we test, it, we didn't find any other uh, direct option that we can actually just take, use, and uh, take advantage, if we test Nova, we can actually use DevStack and let it know that Nova should be from a different repository to pull that, so on. So we, we take advantage of Git GitPrep, which relies as well on the structure, on the structure. So it was the easiest way to go forward. You know, in, in a lot of cases, we take the path of least resistance. You know, we're not, uh, in all honesty, I am technologically agnostic. Right, like I had to be. <laughs> so we don't, you know, it's, it's we do whatever it takes to progress what our, you know, our, our uh, testing and our ability to maintain this stuff forward. So, you know, we're open for ideas always, um, but, and we're willing to share. So go ahead. Yeah.
Sure. Sure. Thanks. Yep, we'll be outside.